In this video, we're going to describe the evolution of stars from main sequence to the red giant stage. We've mentioned before that all stars become main sequence stars after their protostar stage. They become a main sequence star when two things occur. When nuclear fusion reactions are sustained in their cores, that is, that when they turn hydrogen into helium in their core and they keep that process going. And that sustained fusion uh, keeps a balance between gas pressure, which is tending to push outward of the star, <clears throat> and gravity, which is tending to push inward. When those two pressures are in balance, a star is in hydrostatic equilibrium and it is a main sequence star. Most stars are main sequence stars, and this is because they spend 90% of their 90% of their lives in this state. And so, when we look out into space, most stars that we observe are going to be um, in this stage of their lifetime. All of this time, turning their core hydrogen into helium, and that's the fuel that they use to sustain their energy generation and this balance between the competing pressures. But when the hydrogen fuel in the core runs out, that's when a star is no longer a mean sequence star and it becomes something else. When a star leaves the main sequence, that is, when it uh, finishes using up its hydrogen fuel for nuclear reactions, it becomes out of balance. There is no longer a sustained set of energy generating processes to counteract the crushing force of gravity on the inside of a star. And so the competing pressures are no longer in balance, and eventually something has to keep a star from collapsing in on itself. So what's happening on the inside of a star? When the hydrogen is completely converted into helium in the core, then you've got less gas pressure pushing out. And that's demonstrated, or at least depicted in this diagram, where we have a uh, balance between forces on the left. That's the main sequence star, where gas pressure, which is the arrows pointing outward, is balanced with gravitational pressure, the arrows pointing inward. And then on the right side, we've got the follow-up situation. When the hydrogen fuel has been used up, now the core will have less uh, sustained energy generation and eventually none. And so the arrows pushing outward will not have as much pressure uh, compared to the inward gravitational pressure. And so there won't be a balance and the net pressure will be inward. The, the star will effectively get smaller. It will begin to collapse. So what happens to the core? Well we have to differentiate between the outer layers and the core of the star. The core itself will be completely helium. That helium is not fusing into any new elements at this point, but it's still extremely hot. Gravity is going to crush the helium atoms into an even smaller size. And as that occurs, the helium core will get hotter, denser, and will eventually begin fusing, but not yet the outer layers will also collapse down onto the core. The outer layers of the star are just hydrogen atoms which have not to this point been fusing. While the core is collapsing into a very dense hot ball of helium, the outer layers are compressing a very dense layer or shell just around the core. This is just hydrogen atoms but they get so hot and so dense in that shell around the core that they begin fusing. And it's even hotter than the core of the star was before. The hydrogen fusion that begins in this shell is happening at such a fast pace that the outward gas pressure that results from this shell fusion makes the outer layers of the star expand even further than they were when the star was a main sequence star. And so um, the star will expand. And because of this, in the, on the outside, as it gets larger, it will become brighter than it was before. And it will also lose some surface temperature. Eventually, the core of the star 
which is all helium at this point, will collapse down to the point where its temperature is in excess of 100 million Kelvin. At this point, the helium atoms can fuse into carbon and oxygen. And so you get a new set of nuclear processes. This isn't hydrogen into helium. This is helium into carbon and also helium into oxygen. And so what are the net reactions? You have three heliums can fuse into a carbon. You get some energy out. Or you can also have a carbon plus a helium and build an oxygen. And you also get energy out this way. These reactions are going to happen at a much faster pace than the hydrogen to helium reactions that were occurring during the main sequence lifetime of the star. And so later on in what we call the red giant lifetime of the star, we've gone from having uh, a star expanding and getting larger while the core is crushing down and getting smaller. Eventually, the interior of the star will have uh, layers that look like this, where there's a core represented by the black dot in this uh, picture. That's where the helium fusing is taking place, the helium fusion. Helium is fusing into carbon and oxygen nuclei. Around the core is a hot, dense shell of hydrogen material, and that material is fusing, generating an outward flow of energy. That is sustaining a gas pressure which has pushed the outer layers of the star much farther out than they were before. And the outer layers are still just hydrogen and those far outer layers are not fusing into any new elements. When a star has expanded to this point, it's much larger than it was during the main sequence lifetime. The image that I'm showing you here shows the Sun as a main sequence star relative in size to a few other stars, Sirius, Pollux, and Arcturus. But let's take a look at these stars compared to their red giant analogs. So the Sun in this new image is just one pixel in size. But look at Betelgeuse and Antares. These are red giant stars. These are stars that have expanded after the main sequence lifetime to tremendous sizes. Betelgeuse and Antares are so large that if you were to place them in our solar system where the Sun is right now, their layers, their outer layers, would extend beyond the rocky planets. We can also depict this change in properties of stars on the HR diagram. We have a main sequence that is depicted in this HR diagram, represented by the bold diagonal line. And along this line are star symbols that represent main sequence stars of different masses. And so our sun would have a main sequence mass of one solar mass. Here's a star of two solar masses, five, nine, 30, and so on. The other lines, the other colored lines that are represented here on this HR diagram are the property tracks of stars of different masses after they finish their main sequence lifetime. So for a star that is about half the uh, mass of the Sun, I'll point to it here, it's labeled as MS, this star will expand after its main sequence lifetime, and as it becomes larger, it'll become brighter, and it will also decrease very slightly in surface temperature. And so as we follow its life track into the main uh, after the main sequence into the red giant branch, it will go up in luminosity. And that's because it's becoming brighter. A star that is two times the mass of the sun, so not much more massive than the sun, will begin as a main sequence star on, this, on the bold line, and it will go to the right, decreasing in surface temperature, but eventually will uh, increase in luminosity. What happens here is that this star will eventually expand to the point where its decrease in surface temperature on the outer layers are, uh, are different from what's happening in the core. The core will eventually begin fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. And when that occurs, a, the star will truly be a red giant. More massive stars have different life tracks. Uh, they can go beyond the uh, fusion 
of helium into carbon and oxygen and they can fuse even heavier elements, but we'll talk about that in another video. However, their life tracks take them from extreme luminosities to uh, similar luminosities but very low surface temperatures. And so I've circled here the life track which is most similar in this image to the life track of a, a sun-like star. Here is another uh, schematic of the different layers that you would have in these different uh, times during a uh, uh, after the main sequence lifetime of a star. So during the main sequence lifetime of a star <clears throat> you would have hydrogen fusion in the core that's hydrogen and helium and then you'd have a helium core after the main sequence lifetime. There would be a hydrogen shell that develops around that and that causes the outer layers to expand uh, to a larger size. Eventually that shell fusion causes the star to expand to such a large size that uh, it's extremely high in luminosity. However, when a star begins helium core fusion, the uh, outer layers will contract down very slightly, and so the red giant star, when it finally becomes a helium fusing red giant, is just slightly smaller than before, and so it'll lose a little luminosity but a red giant is a red giant when it is fusing helium into carbon and oxygen in its core. And so this is the life of a star after it has finished its main sequence lifetime. Also, another thing can occur. When a star becomes a red giant, during this process <clears throat> it's expanding out, but gravity may pull some of the layers back inward. And when that occurs, some of these inner layers will get hot and denser and will cause an, uh, an increase in the energy generation on the inside of the star. This will cause the outer layers to want to expand again and gravity may pull back. This oscillation between uh, uh, gas pressure and gravity can cause a star, a red giant star, to be what we call a variable star. And so it will get larger, will get smaller, will also be that will result in it appearing brighter and dimmer over time. All of this is regulated by the interior temperature, the density, and the what we call the opacity of a star's atmosphere. The ability of photons to move freely or less free, freely through the atmosphere. There are three types of variable stars that a red giant might become. So uh, they are RR Lyrae variables, Cepheid variables, and Mira variables. These uh, are uh, based on how long of a period the variability uh, is happening in. So RR Lyrae variables, the, the brightening and dimming of, uh, of, or dimming of an RR Lyrae variable happens with a period of less than 24 hours. Cepheid variables can be anywhere from 1 to 400 days in the period of their uh, brightening and dimming. And Mira variables uh, have very long periods over 100 days. I mention these because variable stars have properties that are useful to astronomers in determining distances, something that we'll talk about in another video. So, here's the life of a star. It forms from an interstellar cloud of gas and dust. It will collapse down into a main sequence star, spend most of its life as a main sequence star, and then become a red giant. The details of which we went over in this video. What happens after the red giant stage depends on how massive the star is. So low mass stars and high mass stars have different end results after the red giant stage.